hello, 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 everybody. This is the incredible, the incomparable, the wonderful and talented Ms. Abby Dare, the author of The Girl with the Louding Voice that we're gonna be discussing today. I'm gonna to turn the comments off so that um, we can see her beautiful face without your words scrolling over it. But before we do that, I just wanted everybody to send up just like a cloud of hearts um, to tell her how happy you all are to see her. Thank you. <laughs> coming to us live from London. Look at all that love. Okay, I'm gonna turn this off now. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you knew that we are, that you are well loved and we are not alone. Hi, <laughs> how are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you so much for this honor. Uh, I assure you that the honor is entirely mine and ours. <laughs> are you in London right now? I am in um, somewhere called Bentley, which is about an hour away from London by train. So it's kind of. More or less. Okay. <laughs> well, let's get going. I, I just want to say I, I'm dazzled by this book. And for those of you who are just joining, um, the book of that we're discussing right now is The Girl with the Louding Voice. It's it's very difficult for me to imagine that this could have been anybody's first novel. The The level of skill um, the the beauty, the brilliance, the um, the weaving together of story, the suspense, the heartache, the humor. It is a very serious piece of excellent writing. <laughs> I just want to say that author to author. Um, it's such an honor. Thank begin. you. Oh, really? It's I loved it, and and I'm just going to summarize it. And there will be spoilers in this conversation, everybody. But um, don't let that stop you from from buying the book and reading the book. And I know that a lot of you have purchased it and have read it already. But I'm just going to read a little summary that I wrote of it. Um, this is a beautiful debut novel about a bright spirited and brilliant young Nigerian girl in a rural village, whose mother instills in her early on the dream that she someday will be educated and that her education will bring her not only a voice of her own, but a louding voice, the kind of voice that can stand up to any oppression and help anyone in need. But when her mother dies, that dream dies with her. Adoni's father essentially sells his child into marriage when she is 14 years old, marrying her off to an older man to be his third wife, at which time our heroine becomes nothing but a body whose only value is the possibility that she might someday bear this man a son. When Adune is accidentally pulled into a drama involving the death of her husband's second wife, she must flee the community to save her own life. She's taken in by another older man, an agent who works for wealthy women in the Nigerian capital of Lagos, finding cheap household servants among young, impoverished, desperate city girls. Adune ends up working in the mansion of a rich and often sadistic businesswoman, Yet through all her trials and abuses and obstacles, she still keeps the dream alive of someday becoming educated. This novel is suspenseful, heartbreaking, inspiring, and also despite or perhaps woven into all the pain, it is resoundingly funny. This is a character you will never forget, a witty, snappy, sharp narrator whose voice, once it enters into your consciousness, will never leave you. Um, thank you for this book. <laughs> I loved it so very much. <laughs> um, you know what? I, I you know why I do that because I hate it as an author when I go onto a program and they ask me to summarize my own book. <laughs> I was gonna say like I couldn't have done it the way you did. Like I was just go. I don't need wanted to get didn't want to get married and that's at the end. Go read it. So thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. That. I'm always so grateful when I'm interviewed that somebody else will summarize it because I it's like I'm so close to it. I also often yes. feel like I don't, how am I supposed to know what this is about? Yeah, you know, like I, I just exactly. wrote it. <laughs> um, so I'm glad that you, uh, I'm glad that you didn't see that as invasive of me doing that. So um, I want to start by talking about the voice of your, narr of your narrator, of Adonai. Um, immediately within the first few pages, I was so pulled into this story. And for me as a writer and as a reader, voice is everything. Um, I will read a book on literally any topic if the voice pulls me in, and I will be unable to read a book on literally any topic if the voice does not stir me, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. And having the ability to create a strong voice in writing is, well, we can talk about this later, but I'm not sure it's something that can be taught. <laughs> I think it's sort of an, an intuitive thing. It's, it's really the art of writing. And as I was reading along and I was thrilling to her language. Um, 
really thrilling to the song of it and the dance of it and the parry and thrust of it and the, the power of it. And I was thinking, I've never read anything like this. I've never met a character like this before. And then I heard an interview with you where you explained that the reason that I've never heard a, a voice like this before is because you essentially made up her language. Um, and I wonder if you could just start by talking about that because that, my dear, is, I mean, I bow to you, that is dazzling. I have never written a book where I had to actually invent the language of the, of the narrator. So please tell me how you did that and how you got the, the courage and the inspiration to do that. Well, thank you. I, I think for Aduni, it was, I think the first thing was because there was no one waiting. So I was doing my creative writing masters and I wanted to get an A and I got a lot of feedback that I, you know, plotting wasn't too bad, but my characterization really was really crap. And so wow. when, I knew, <laughs> when I knew I was going to write this story, I wanted to tell, obviously I wanted to tell the story of some of the girls that I knew growing up that were housemates, but it was important for me to have as um, authentic as possible for the character to have the voice that reflected some of the girls that I knew growing up. And these girls were not educated. These girls were all semi-educated. So they were taken out of school at a very young age. And so coming to write the girl with the loud voice, the first thing I did was, okay, what is she going to sound like? She had to sound quite similar to some of the girls that I knew. So what I did was I pulled in a few things. And I, I'm now looking back, I don't, know, I don't understand how it, it, it just clicked. But it was me, first of all, taking my mother tongue, which is Yoruba and doing a literal translation of Yoruba into English. And I've spoken to a few people that don't just speak English, they speak other languages. And they say that when they do a literal translation, it doesn't quite sound like it's correct, but you understand what the person is saying if you were speaking English. And so I had that. And then I also had my daughter who was at the time two years old, who was born in the UK, but it was also coming into English language and navigating it in her own way. And so I did a lot of borrowing from her. So I would go around, go literally go with her around the house when she was speaking and steal some of the things she was saying. And then of course, inventing new words. So where I couldn't find, where there were gaps in the confluence of my daughter's, my two-year-old daughter's speech and, um, and the conversion of my mother tongue, I will then create new words and sort of fill the gap. And I was just having fun. So there was no expectation. I think that's what really helped is knowing that anything would happen with this book, right? I didn't know what could happen with it. And I, I was able to flow very freely in, in being able to do that. So that was, that was fun. This is so incredible. Um, I also remember hearing you say in an interview that, you know, Nigeria is such an incredibly diverse country. There's so much diversity within Nigeria and so many of, there's also so much immigration from other countries. And so there, there was a level at which no two housemates who you ever mo met spoke exactly the same way. So you couldn't just um, replicate a, a speech pattern that was out there. And, and, and so you came to call it non-standardized English. Is that, yes. did I get that correct? Yeah. Yes, I called it non-standard English because it wasn't Pigeon English, yeah. which is very common, uh, which everybody speaks. I also speak it. So I, I just thought, okay, non-standard English, I think is, is more reflective of this character's voice. I wonder if you might read to us um, a little bit from the opening scene from uh, page, uh, again, everybody, we're talking about the girl with the louding voice, um, from page five um, to the end of page six. This is a moment in that we're right at the very beginning of the story where um, Adonai finds out that her her family's financial, great news, her family, her father brings her to tell her, great news, all our financial woes are over. <laughs> bad news, here's why, <laughs> except he doesn't <laughs> view it as bad news. Um, uh, here's, here's, here's how we just raised a bunch of money for this family. So I'm wondering if you could just uh, read that and establish the scene for us. Sure. I'm reading in what I call Adonai's voice. And I'm reading from page five, towards the end of page five. Where will we find that kind money? I ask. Morufu, Papa say. You know him? He come here yesterday to see me. Morufu, the taxi driver. Morufu is an old man taxi driver in our village with the face of a he goat. Apart from his two wives, Morufu is having four children that didn't go to school. They just be running around the village stream in their dirty pants, pulling sugar cartons with string playing suey and clapping their hand up until the skin about to peel off. Why was Morufu visiting our house? What was he finding? 
Yes, Papa said with a tight smile. He's a good man, that Morufo. He surprised me yesterday when he said he will pay community rent for us, all the 30,000. That is good. I asked the question because it didn't make sense. Because I know that no man will be paying for anybody's, somebody's rent until, unless he's wanting something. Why would Morufu pay our community rent? What was he wanting? Or is he owing Papa monies from before in the past? I look my Papa, my eyes filling with hope that it is not the thing I am thinking. Papa? Yes. Papa waits, swallows spit, and wipes his front head sweat. The rent monies is among your worry. My oh worry, you mean my bride price. My heart is starting to break because I'm only 14 years going 15 and I'm not marrying any foolish, stupid old man because I'm wanting to go back to school and learn teacher work and become an adult woman and have money to be driving car and living in fine house with cushion sofa and be helping my papa and my two brothers. I don't want to marry any men's or any boys or any on another person forever. So I asked papa again, talking real slow. Mm -hmm. So he'll be catching every word I'm saying and not mistaking me in his answer. Papa, is this bride price for me or for another person? And my papa, he nod his head slowly slow, not minding the tears standing in my eyes or the opening wide of my mouth as he's saying, the bride price is for you, Adoni. You'll be marrying Morufu next week. Thank you so much. So that's the beginning of the book. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit more about the writing craft. This may be a very bold thing to say, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I had, I had this intuition as I was reading that first chapter because it's, it moves so quickly and so assuredly, and her voice is so completely grounded in itself. Um, I thought, it feels like she wrote this that this was always the beginning of the book, you know, like that you just started, that you had this, this, it was almost like, I felt like you were downloading something, like it was so assured and, and there were, there was so much covered in the first six pages of the book. There's a whole novel before the novel begins that you don't go into, but you just, that, that Adunia just summarizes, you know, um, here's my story. This is where I live. My mother died. I got taken out of school. I was bullied for being the oldest girl in the school. You know, she just, and my dad started drinking, there's no money, there's kids everywhere. Like you pour this entire like prehistory into this incredibly tight six pages. And um, I just, I don't know, I wanted to say like, did you, did you just, was that how the story began when it first came to you? Did it just pile into those first few pages? Cause man, it feels like it. I, I think that as a writer, you have some stories that you carry within you for years and you don't even realize you carry them. And I think the girl with the loud voice was, is one of those stories. It wasn't my first attempt at writing. I tried so many times and failed so many times. But I think she just arrived fully formed, fully made, demanding to be heard. And I felt like I had no choice but to obey her. I say it all the time. I say that, you know, the first, I think the first line of that novel has never changed from the first time I wrote it. it was I knew it. I knew it. I knew that first it. line. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and, and as, as, a, as a well-seasoned writer that you are, you know that first lines are things that you agonize over. I, I yeah. didn't with this one. It just came. And from that, it felt like, okay, just bang, 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 keep on going. I had very little, I think the first, again, first chapter, first line, very little edits went into that. I mean, you know, as I was working through the story with editors, the, you know, their parts were chopped and moved about, but the first chapter never changed. First line never changed. I so knew yes, it. I think it just, <laughs> it was just there. We sort of regurgitated it all out. And I was like, there you go. Nice and easy. Um, yeah, I wish everything, every other story could be like that, but it was- I do too, <laughs> you know, I do too. And I think the reason I sensed that is because I felt, all right, let's just go into the mystical aspect of writing here. I, <laughs> I felt, that um, and I felt I know I know the difference as a writer in my own work between what I am laboring over and creating with my own effort and what is being given to me through some mis mysterious source. And that beginning felt to me like 
I was like, oh, she got, she, her antenna picked up somebody who just said, here, write this down. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You know? write absolutely. Down. It just, it just, it felt like I was um, like a messenger delivering um, a message onto people, you know, and I had no choice but to obey. I say it all the time. It felt like I didn't know, it was just sitting on my shoulder and saying, go, 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 go. And there was a bit of urgency as well. I, you know, there were times where even though I did not know where this book was going, I mean, I'd been through a period of prayer and writing and just meditation and all of that. But when I started this story, it felt like I couldn't take a break. I, you know, every time I was sitting down and, and, and resting, I would hear in my spirit, get up and go right, go right, go. So it just felt like I had to, I had to do it. In those first, I think the first draft took about six to eight months. It was nothing else but that. I did nothing else but that in every single moment that I had. So yeah, you, you totally get that for certain stories. And this was one of those ones. It's so wild. And I, I, I wanted to talk about that because I, um, it's so wild. Also, like, how did I know that? I, I think I know it because I, I, because I could feel it. I could feel the life, the actual life in it. Mm. And, um, and there's an energetic, it just actually gave me chills. There's like an energetic feeling to it. Um, I want to say this because a lot of people who will be listening to this now, and then a lot of people listen to this later mm -hmm. who are writers or who are aspiring writers. Um, those moments happen and they are exceedingly rare. Um, and you can't wait for them and you can't prepare for them and you can't make it happen again. And the best that you can do is just to continue with your work. Like I want to go back and talk about more of your writing journey because um, you know, you said all I did was work on this. You're an extraordinarily accomplished woman. You have a law degree, you have multiple degrees. You have a law degree, you have a project management degree. You were a mother of two little kids when you were doing this work. Um, you know, and you were in an MFA program. So something had made you go, you know, I want to talk about your own journey into writing because it, it doesn't look like it was a direct shot. It looks like maybe it was something that you always loved, but you created these other paths as well. So, um, and I also just want to conclude this whole mysticism thing by saying, you know, go back to talking about what you wrote that failed because that's also how it works is that you, you know, you try and you effort and you struggle and, and it doesn't work and it doesn't work and it doesn't work. And then one day, um, one day, who, who is it who I heard? They said, you, you keep dipping the barrel down into the well and nothing comes out and dipping the barrel. And then one day up comes the water. And it feels to me like in this case, you hit a wellspring and just a fountain started <laughs> to come out of you. So anyway, go back and talk about your own journey in, um, in becoming a writer and what has guided you through that. So I, I mean, I had been, I'd loved writing for a long time. I came into the UK as, as a student and I started a blog. Oops, you just went mute, my love. Okay, we lost. I came Start over. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, it's all good now. So I came to the UK as a student and I started a blog because I felt very lost. It wasn't my first time of coming to England, but it was my first time of living in, in England as, as somebody who had... Oops, we've, you lost, we lost your voice again. So sorry, Abby, we can't hear you. Can't hear you. <laughs> we can't hear you. Just now, but we missed everything that you just said. I don't know why your voice keeps oh, coming it out. It might have been the call. So I put my phone on silent, but it's still silent. Oh, you know what happens on Instagram Live is if you don't put it on Do Not Disturb, which I also forgot to do, um, yes. the calls coming in will cut you yes. off sometimes. It's okay. I would I love to hear I everything I that you just it. said all over again. So I okay. should start with, I came to England as a student. We missed everything after that. <laughs> <laughs> so I came in as a student and I started a blog because I was trying to understand what I was feeling. I felt quite displaced. I felt confused. I loved living in the, in, in the UK, but I, I really missed home. So I began this blog and I began to talk about my life experiences. And it was quite funny, but it was one of those things where it quickly grew out of what I could control. So it became, it, it, what we say now is viral. It, it got viral. It became one thing that everyone was discussing on radio in Lagos. People who were looking to relocate to the UK were looking at my blog. 
for ideas and thoughts and feelings. And um, what I did was my mom then called me one day and said that somebody came into her office um, and asked why I hadn't updated my blog. I was like, what? You, you know about my blog? I think that for me, that was when I realized that this was, it was a bit much. I wasn't ready for this. But what that did in me was it birthed in me um, a love for the written word i realized i had struck something that i had to hold on to because it gave me life and so i stopped blogging so I stopped writing about my own life experiences but i turned to fiction and i kept on writing stories and sharing with family and friends did a bit of self-publishing and everyone had something great to say but each time i thought to do something with it so try to find an agent i was so scared of rejection I, I, I felt like I wasn't good enough. Um, and so everybody around me, my husband would be like, you can, you can do this. But I felt very frustrated with it. And so I, I think I wrote about a million words in practice, you know, just over and over and over again, writing stories. Then came my master's in creative writing. I, the master's degree for me was the one final shot. So I said to myself, I said, I will put in an application for this. If I get one rejection, that's it. I'm never ever going to write again in my life. Oh and my so God, thank application. God you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so I put the, the application in. And they were like, hey, I listen, we got we to gotta get this woman into an MFA program. Somebody's got to say yes. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a bit crazy. So I put the application in and I remember I was at work at my desk and the, it was a 15 minute journey from my office. And I said to myself, I'm going to cancel this. I'm not going to do this because I will get rejected. So I, I emailed the supervisor, the guy that was going to interview me. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to attend this. Um, and he, he emailed me shortly later and he said, well, when do you want to attend? Because I'm going to wait for you to turn up. And I thought, wow, that's a sign. So I thought, okay, well, maybe I can, I can come. I will come. So I went in there, we had a chat and he offered me the, the, the space and I did my master's in creative writing. And then when it was time for me to submit, to write the piece of my thesis, the dissertation, like I said to you that I got a lot of feedback from sharing stories in class that, you know, I mean, we just don't understand your characters. We can't get them. They're just not rounded. All those things that people say, they're too flat. They're, you know, all of that. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to write the story about this girl and whatever happens with that happens. And so I wrote the first 3000 words that night. And I remember going into my supervisor's office and my heart was just beating. Cause I thought he was going to say, look, Abby, we've been, we spent the last, one and a half years you still don't get it and so i sat there and he, he really took his time you know he was doing stuff and he was and then he turned to me and he said look i've been sitting here all morning so much and i put my head down and i thought oh he's just gonna go at me and he says yours comes in and i and this is it. got to you've got to do something with this can you finish this story and i said to him i will try okay time out that went a little bit jagged can you say that again he said this is exactly what i've been looking for yeah so he said this is what i've been looking for in our writers this is the story this is the kind of writing that makes you just sit up can you do this can you sustain this for for a novel and i said no <laughs> do you have three thousand words that's all i'm gonna give you um, and, and, and he said, look, Abby, you need to, I mean, I think there's something in this. I think you need to, you need to finish it. And so I'm quite spiritual. So I pray, I pray quite a lot. So I, I, I took it to prayer. I prayed, asked God for help. And I just kept going, you know, I, I didn't even stop to think as to whether it made sense. I think sometimes you just need one person to believe in you. And, you know, and that one person in this case was my supervisor who said to me, Abby, just go ahead and do this. And I just sat down and I just poured my hat out into the story. And um, I put in for a, a, a competition called the Bath Novel Award. Let me know when you, you can't hear me anymore because I'm not sure what's going on with the Wi-Fi. I got you. I put if in I for the Bath Novel I'll just, I'll just do this, okay? okay this will be our thank signal, you. but otherwise yeah. I'm good. <laughs> if you so see I, me just I, nodding I and smiling, it means... Good, good. <laughs> So I put in for this competition called the Bath Novel Award and it was, um, it was anonymous. So it was judged anonymously. No one was going to know who I was. And as somebody who was battling with severe self-confidence issues in my writing, I thought that was the perfect opportunity for me. And so if anyone listening here, 
and you're looking to write Bath Novel Award, I know there's so many others that now judge anonymously, but it really helps a writer that feels that I don't want anyone to know my name. I just want to put into this. And if I, if nobody, if, if nothing comes out of it, no one knows. And so I, I put a timer on my, a reminder on my phone to put in for the um, award. And I kept um, snoozing it. Every time it came up, I'll snooze it. Every time it came up, I'll snooze it. On the last day, the final day for the award competition, I fell asleep. And at 10 minutes to midnight, it felt like something tapped me on the shoulder. And I, it's so scary thinking about it. It felt like something tapped me on the shoulder. And I woke up and I was like, oh my gosh. So the snooze thing had come up. It was like, you know, Bath Novel Award deadline. I was like, oh my gosh, I've literally got like three minutes. So I went in, put in my, put in my manuscript, click send, paid 25 pounds. It was the best 25 pounds I've ever spent in my life because I won the competition. My agent was judging she was a maternity list, you know, she was a maternity list. She was one of those agents that I had always wanted her to represent me. But I remember going and seeing that she was a maternity leave before I put in for the competition. I thought she's, you know, she's not going to read this, but I didn't realize that she was actually going to judge. And so she judged it, loved it. And she offered me representation and it just went completely crazy from there. It's just been an amazing journey that has completely changed my life. And now how many languages has it been published in? 16 languages now. <laughs> <laughs> we, I think we know who tapped you on the shoulder. <laughs> I, I, do you see the irony as you're telling this story about struggling with this huge lack of self-confidence to write a novel about one of the most self-confident female characters I have ever encountered in the entirety of literature? like out of you, through you, in all of the insecurity that you felt and all of the sense of lack of belonging comes this young girl who's like, I'm going to take up all the space on this earth. I'm going to use my voice all the time. I'm, I'm here. I exist. I, it, there's just this force in her. And I, and I wonder how, how do you see the dichotomy of, you know, your own insecurity and Adonai's tremendous presence um, that, you know, she speaks truth to power, even at, at the point of being beaten for it. Like there's, she's constantly being told actually to shut up um, because she's about to literally be beaten because she won't stop asking questions and she won't stop putting herself forward. Um, and it, and it, yeah, I'm just curious how you see the dichotomy between your own sense of unworthy or not good enough, or I shouldn't be in this space versus her. I want to have a louding voice. I think that it was me sort of projecting what I'd be like, I would love to be like. And every time, and, and you know, especially when I was writing her story, there were parts that I would write and I'll go, no, Abby, that's you. That's you. Adonis is not going to do that. And it, it was very interesting because it felt like everything that I would do was what Adonis would not do. And seeing her as a real human telling me Abby, that this, you know, what you're writing in there is not me. It, it's very weird and very strange. But yes, you know, I, it was almost like everything that um, she was almost a, the opposite of who I who I am and who you know who and she's somebody I'm striving to be, right? So it was almost like I was creating a role model of. Oops, learn frozen again, her. my love. Oh, all oh, right, okay. Um, what did, oh, when you I, said you were creating stuff. a role model? Yeah, it felt like I was creating a role model for myself to learn from. So that um, when I was faced with, you know, really difficult, especially when I was writing, when I felt like I had lost a bit of track of the story, it would be like, she would say to me, no, you can't give up now. You've got, I need to be heard. You've got to finish the story. So yes, it was almost like writing the opposite of myself, which is interesting when you're trying to create a character in, in, in literature and deciding to divorce yourself from the character you're creating and look at them as a whole individual and write a story about them. I think it's quite magical when you can do that. Um, so yes, it was really just writing the opposite of who, who I am and looking up to her for help to finish this story. I just see her over your shoulder, tapping you on that shoulder at five minutes to midnight and being like, Sister, you got to wake up because <laughs> you've got to get up. You know, I cried so hard. Send this thing in. I will yeah, be heard, I, and you yes. are going to be my voice piece. Like Absolutely. I will be heard. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I cried so, so real. hard when I, 
when I finished the, the editing process, it was, it took me, I think a year to, to stop thinking in Aduni's voice in her head. Mm. It was really hard. I understand that. I, I cried for hours when I wrote the last page of the signature of all things. I missed Alma. I missed her. I cried on the last oh. page of the city of girls. I missed, I missed uh, Vivian. And, and I know what it feels like to write people who are what you would like to be. Um, and, and I almost think at times after you've written them, I feel like my nature and my character is now braided. My DNA is now braided into their DNA. Um, and that's why I don't think of my books as my children. I think of me as my books as children, you know, because my books call me forward. Like I'm, I can't imagine that you're not a more confident person from having a Dooney's voice inside of you for yes. that long. Amazing. I am. I am. Interesting. Um, so I want to talk about an, another subtlety that I loved um, in your book. So, so much of so, and again, everybody, we're talking about The Girl with the Louding Voice by Abby Dare. Um, so much of this book is about the, really the evils of patriarchy. Um, and one thing that I uh, have experienced um, as a traveler and, and is that we have a tendency sometimes to romanticize traditional culture. Um, and there's so much in traditional culture that is so rich and beautiful and to be envied, um, deep community, intergenerational uh, storytelling, um, a sense of belonging, a sense of place, the art and the music that grows up indigenously out of traditional cultures, the beauty um, that, that is produced. But, but also when we look closely at traditional cultures, we are able to see that they tend to be really terrible for women. <laughs> um, like really terrible for women. And I just had this conversation recently with my friend Maggie Doyne, who runs an organization called Blink Now, and she started a school in Nepal and she was discussing, you know, how difficult it is to come into a culture and not and want to uplift the women, but not want to impose um, contemporary modern Western foreign values into the into into the delicate ecosystem of a culture, but at the same time people are beating women and children to death. You know, so it's it's tough, um, and and I, I, what I admired in in your book was that you didn't you didn't have any simple cartoonish characters, um, and it would have been very easy for you to have written a book where all the men were evil and all the women were the solution, um, but you didn't. There were some really good men in this book who end up in, in a couple cases. Her Adini's life is saved um, by men by the kindness of men. Um, and, and she also encounters brutal femininity, um, within this culture and her, she's just as severely abused by the wealthy, um, woman who she comes to work for as she was by her husband, by her father. So she doesn't find safety necessarily in, um, and by the, the first wife of her first, of her husband, you know, so, and we see this harrowing scene where, um, a character named Miss Tia, who's, Who's, uh, who does hold privilege and is very educated and comes from the abroad um, or has lived in the abroad, um, where she um, she's severely beaten by a, a group of women for the crime of being infertile. So you, the, the amazing thing about that is that you don't take any, sh any moral shortcuts in the book. Um, you know, morality and immorality are spread very evenly throughout the story. The challenging thing is you also don't provide any easy answers because <laughs> if the answer is just uplift women, you know, uplift local businesswomen, then we end up with Big Madam who, you know, is, <laughs> is brutal to, to girls. So um, I wanted to talk about how you, how you navigated that, um, how you navigated those issues of patriarchy, of gender, of privilege. Um, there's so much that is tucked into there. So you can answer that question that was a really long like dissertation length question anywhere you <laughs> want to jump in. <laughs> I, I, I think that when I started writing, I went in with trying to highlight the, my pain at, as a young girl going, being, you know, born into a middle-class family and being given an opportunity to get educated in a very, very good secondary school and going off to, to boarding school and coming back and seeing young girls like myself who were working and denied that opportunity. That's all I started at, getting at and writing. But I quickly realized that this was a much bigger thing than just talking about child labor and how 
young girls were ill-treated by the people that hired them. I quickly realized that this was a story or a journey of a girl who would start in poverty and look to education as the answer to all of her problems and wealth. But then she must realize that as she goes through that whole trajectory, as she goes from one end to the other, she must realize that that's actually not quite right. Education is amazing, it's powerful, and it allows you to be empowered and make decisions for yourself. But in a society like Nigeria, and in many parts of the world, I would say, the fact that you're an educated woman doesn't mean that life will be easy for you. And so I sat down and I thought to myself, how would Adeni look through the eyes of other women who have these things that she wants and understand that it doesn't stop by getting an education? That we don't know where it stops at, but it just doesn't stop at that. And so by bringing in different women and trying to understand what women that I've seen growing up, I've heard from, have faced in their lives and relationships and jobs and, and uh, businesses, what have they faced and how can, how can I talk about these things through Adini's eyes? And so I then began to, and, and many of the characters actually fell into my lap because I felt, okay, she's going to get married. That was, that was always defined. But then I, but I thought, okay, she's going to get married, but what if she meets another wife, another two, another, you know, two wives and two, two different ideas of marriage? And, you know, what, 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 what would that look like? through her eyes. So it was really just that. And, it, and, as, and as she moved from one place to the other, it was important for me to make a conscious effort to have a woman, another woman that she could look at and either relate with or to, or not relate with. And of course, as, and in doing that, then also trying to find a balance by bringing in the men and saying, because we know, and at least I've seen that many of the women are gatekeepers of patriarchy. And so how, how would you sort of have that nuanced view? sort of from Adeni's eyes. And I think it was just really that and just finding characters that were as rounded as possible. So having the flaws and having all the great sides and bringing them together and having Adeni look at them and, you know, sometimes make fun of them, sometimes give them a bit of her nuggets of wisdom, get them to wake up and, and, and smell the coffee. It's such an interesting answer because I, this is why I love fiction because there's so much that you can pour into it. Um, I used, <laughs> sometimes I feel like when I'm writing fiction and there's themes, there's like social themes that I want to write about. I think um, I'm basically making a bran muffin with chocolate frosting on it <laughs> 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 to trick people. I love you know, that. Like to trick people and like, oh, that looks like a cupcake, you know? Mm -hmm. And then um, and like, and the great writing and the fun character is the cupcake yeah. appearance. But I've actually like hidden nutrition in, in the cupcake because there's something that I want to talk about that I want to share. Um, you know, when you, when you talked about women being the gatekeepers of patriarchy, you know, I, I would, I would feel like I should read a, a scholarly paper on that, but I don't want to, <laughs> you know, like I'm sure somebody has written sociological scholarly papers yes. at the highest level of the UN about, you know, <laughs> what we are to do about this. But I'm, the honest truth is that I'm not probably going to read that. But when I read, when you broke down in, in the place of fiction, the relationship between Big, Mad, Big Madam, who is um, the, the incredibly wealthy woman who uh, Adina goes to work for in Lagos, who, you know, is a, is a self-made, she's a self-made millionaire, essentially, through her fabric business. And she holds the highest possible station, um, you know, that a woman can have in, in, in this city. She's, she's admired, she's feared. And she has a husband who's um, an alcoholic, who's abusive, who's a sexual predator, and who she completely supports and literally props up. Like she literally props him up financially because his very presence associated with her as a man yes. gives her a certain amount of power, even as he's destroying her life. That storyline, um, which I've never seen told quite the way that you told it, tells me more about what it means to be a gatekeeper of patriarchy. It makes me look at where I have done that in my life, it makes me look at where the women in my life who grew up, who are from New England, <laughs> are doing that with the men in their lives, propping up this pup, this like paper, this puppet 
of, of um, a sort of ma a male figure to make them look more respectable when in fact they're the ones who are pouring all of themselves into the family. Like that's why I, I delight in, in, in reading as widely as I can possibly read because this is, I learned more reading this book than I would have learned taking a sociology class on gender. Um, I, in, in, not just in developing countries, not, I, I, don't, I think it's rude to even call Nigeria a developing country, but, you know, like, <laughs> not, just in, in, not just in countries and cultures that are unfamiliar to me, but, but reading that made me understand more about myself um, and about the, the relationships between women and men in my own family, um, mm -hmm. because there's a lot that felt like it wasn't that different. That wasn't a question, but <laughs> and and I agree. And, and I appreciate you know, the, the education. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the interesting thing is, uh, as a writer, I don't know if it happens to you as well. You you're telling the story, and you're not you're not consciously going in and saying, yeah. Well, you you start with I want to tell a story about X Y Z, but then you finish it and you step back and you think, wow, I've told a story about A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. That's a bit like how it felt with me with the story is, you know, I went in telling one story, but then even I, I get surprised when I speak to different people and, and people tell me some of the things they've pulled out of it that I, I didn't, I'm not conscious of these things. Um, I'm just going in trying to, to do one thing. And, and, you know, you're looking at it with different eyes. I don't know if you, you, you've, you've had that with, with some of your writing where you're surprised by when you get to the end and you're thinking wow you know so much has come out of this that you learn from as well well yeah and that goes back to why i hate when people ask me to summarize one of my mm. books because yes. um i don't know what it's about you know what it's about <laughs> once you read it because everybody brings yeah. their own life and their own interpretation to it you know um mm -hmm. i know what my book was but i don't know what my book was in your consciousness mm -hmm. and i would rather hear somebody tell me what they i've even had people um, come up to me and tell me things that changed their life that were in Eat, Pray, Love that were actually not in the book. <laughs> yes. yes, that was such a powerful book, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it wasn't even in there, you know, like, <laughs> like I had a woman come up to me and say, I was able to leave my abusive marriage because of you talking about that day when you finally realized you weren't going to tolerate physical abuse anymore. And I was like, okay, that never happened to me. And that's not in the book. But I didn't say that to her because I love that that was transmitted, yes. you know? Um, so sometimes it's not even about what you, mm. what you put or didn't put in there. It's about mm. the living, you know, going back to the mysticism of writing fiction and y something was poured through you into these pages that then went and has its own life in the world um, beyond what, what you could ever imagine in people's interior lives. Um, and we're just the messengers <laughs> as fiction writers. That's, that's all we can be. Um, yes. I, I, I wanted to ask you um, how the book has been received in Nigeria. Wow, I, it's been interesting. I remember the first, one of the first book clubs I, I attended, I think there was a lot of people on it and it was for two hours. It was on Zoom and I was terrified because I, I remember that I was saying to my husband the night before the book was released that is it too late to pull out? And so, well, it's not too late, but a few people might just kill you for all the investment they've made in this story and you want to pull it out. Because I was terrified. I felt like I had, you know, you hear a lot about people saying poverty porn, you know, African writers always write about suffering. But I wasn't even thinking about that when I was writing this story. I just wanted to tell this young girl's story. So, but then finishing it, I didn't realize, oh my gosh, I think I might have done that. I was mm. terrified. And so I'm going into this book club and, and seeing all the faces on Zoom and I'll say to myself, look, I will just exit the Zoom if I feel that these guys are going to kill me. And they did come at me quite hard. You know, they, these are Nigerians who, who were able to sort of take the book apart and come at me with really hard questions around the voice, around certain choices, around why I might have painted certain um, cultures in a certain light. Um, but towards the end, there was a lot of love. And I remember somebody saying to me, look, Abby, I am going to take responsibility from today. I will look at my neighbor and see what they're doing with their housemates. And I will speak up about this because for the first time in my life, because you've made Adjani so real, I've looked at my housemates as somebody who's real. I remember one wow. of my best friends calling me and saying, she was, she was close to tears and she was saying that she has a daughter and she and her daughter have had many conversations about her future. 
what she wants to be. Does she like to play music and piano, all of that? And she had a maid that was about her daughter's age. And she said, Abby, I don't even know her son name. Like, it's not anything you're conscious of. And my mom said the same. My mom is 72 now. And she called me and said, was I, was I bad? You know, was I like big madam? I was like, no, you weren't, you weren't, this is not you. And so a lot of people have had to look within, within Nigeria because they understand these things. Getting a maid, getting a houseboy is day to day. It's as natural as, I don't know, getting onto the train and going to work. And so this story has made a lot of people just stop and pause and look at what we've all been doing and taking as normal and saying this has to stop. And that, that for me is powerful. So there was some criticisms to the story, but the biggest takeaway from it was the fact that people thought, look, we've got to do something about this. And that's just incredible. That's extraordinary. Um, because again, a lot of people um, watching this uh, now and in the future um, are writers or wish to be writers or are planning to be writers. So much of what stops us from, you know, there's, I feel like we have these two channels in our brain and it's sort of a toggle switch and it's fear and creativity. Um, and, and one can't really be fully on if the other one is fully on. And, um, and if, in order for me to obey what the creativity is calling me to do, I have to be very free. Um, and I, and I have to be, um, I have to be very loose and I have to be very open and I have to have no expectations for outcome. Um, otherwise it blocks it. Right. Um, but, but the fear of rejection, the fear of criticism, my experience with creativity is that the fear never ends, no matter where you get to, um, in your career, you know, I'm sure you were afraid of publication day. I'm sure you were afraid of the book reviews. I'm sure you're afraid of the question, what are you going to do next? I'm sure you like, no matter how high up you go, there's always like the fear matches it along the way. So <laughs> I was just wondering if you might be able to speak to, um, strategies that you've had for absorbing criticism or not absorbing it, um, dealing with um, rejection, uh, the pain of making something with your very, very best effort and then putting it out into the world and having to allow people to have all kinds of opinions about it. Um, Man, it's difficult. It's, and, it's and as your hard. first book to get this much attention. So, so I'm wondering if you can talk about that. It's, you know, I remember that when the book was still in 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 its arc its galley so it's it was proofs it wasn't um fully published yet it was being shared with with a few people and i think on net galley which is like a website where uh, people could request proofs and read the story i remember that i i do not know what made me go to that website that day this was about two months before the book came out and i want to be like was, no don't do uh, it don't go don't oh look. god <laughs> It was a, I can never forget, it was a one star review from somebody who said she was Nigerian and she said, no one speaks like this. No one is like this. This is horrible, blah, blah, blah. And I sat there and I cried my eyes out. And my daughter came back from school and she said, mom, what's wrong? And I was like, somebody really loved a really horrible review. And she's like, mom, what are you, why are you, you've written an amazing book. They don't matter. They don't know you. They don't know the story. So you've got to be brave. You tell me to be brave. Now it's your turn to be brave. And you've got to stop reading these things. And I and that little girl really saved my life because from that day on, I made up my mind that I would protect my space from any negativity that would cripple me, at least until I found a way to deal with it. Now, that was at the beginning. Now that I've gone through the journey, I understand that it's an opinion and everyone has different opinions. Not everyone is going to like you. Not everyone's going to like your story. Rejection is part of life, is part of the journey. What I tend to do is I try to take the constructive criticism. And so you, you can tell from the tone of some of the things that you get, you know, you, you get DMs from people going at you from the first, from the first word you can tell. And you should delete. I just, I love the delete and the block button. I just delete and get rid of it. But if it's constructive, I take it on and I, and I use that. But I also try to, especially as I'm trying to work in another story and there's a huge fear of, oh my goodness, you know, there is an expectation. I try to completely block it all out. And I try to, like you were saying, I try to sit, when I sit down to try to write, I say to myself, the 
only thing I can control right now are the words that are coming from my head through my fingertips onto the page. Nothing else right now is within my control apart from that. So why don't I control that and then deal with everything else later? And that's the only way you can go from zero words to 80,000 words to writing the end and going through editing processing processes. And that's the way I deal with it. I just try to take each day at a time, block our negative criticisms, understand that rejection is part of life. And if you have never been published, do not stop seeking that publication. If you believe in the story you're writing, because the love for your story, your passion for your story is always going to follow that book wherever it goes throughout the world after it has left your hands. And that's what matters. So if you don't feel any passion for that story, I would say set it aside and seek for that thing which sets your soul on fire and pour your heart into that. Thank you for that. I wish somebody had told me that when I was 22. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I also think um, that there is something to be said because we always say like, don't seek external validation, but, but it seems to be very key in your origin story and it was in mine as well. Um, there were people before you were published who liked what you were writing. And there were people before I was published who liked what I was writing. Yeah. Um, my friends liked it. My family members liked it. And I know that there's a, there's a temptation to dismiss that and be like, well, that doesn't have any validity because they have to, um, because they're my friends. But I chose to believe them. Um, I chose to believe that they weren't only humoring me because they mm -hmm. seemed, it seemed that their reaction was authentic. And, and I remember like a lot of what got me through early rejection was, look, my friends like books, you know, and they like my writing. So, you know, I might not be that far off the mark, you know, um, if, if some people like what I'm doing and they also like books that I like, then yes. maybe there's a Venn diagram somewhere. There's some Obviously. magical thing that's going to happen where people who are the gatekeepers who publish the books might also like it because they're not probably that different from from me and my friends. So, um, so yeah, I would, I would say to you, if, if you've ever gotten any positive response anywhere from anybody, no matter what their relationship is to you, believe it, <laughs> choose to believe it, choose to believe it because it's just people. Um, you know, I was so surprised when I met, um, people who were in publishing and I was like, oh, they're just humans. They're not. Yes. Um, they're, yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. When you've wanted me for so long, I kept on pinching myself sitting in the publisher's office, I'll just pinch my thighs. I'm like, this is real. Oh my, these are real people. They're, they're human. They're humans. Exactly. Um, so two, two last questions and then I'll let you go. Cause I know it's, it's late where you are. Um, I want to talk to you about your, the female lineage in your life and in your family. You, you wrote such a beautiful dedication to your mother at the beginning of this book. And then in every interview I've heard or read with you, you've mentioned your daughters, including the fact that part of the origin story of this was a conversation that you had with your daughter. Um, you know, there's a line in the novel where um, one of um, Adonis peers, a girl her age says, I wish I am a man um, because she has had that realization that so many of us hit at a very young age, which is the understanding that man, this boy, this life would probably be a lot easier if I wasn't, if I wasn't in this female body. And, and yet, you know, you write so beautifully about these deep female relationships and the power of female love um, and mentorship. And, and so I wanted to know a little bit more about your relationship with your mom and your relationship with your, your daughters and what you received um, as, as wisdom and learning and education and inspiration from your mother and what you receive from your daughters. And that's a beautiful question. My, my mom was, or is, but you know, growing up, she became very quickly responsible for my, my upbringing and my education because she got divorced from my father. I think I was about 12 or so. And so I, she very quickly told me that, listen, I'm, I'm doing this alone, right? And there's no option for us to fail. It's just you and I and your brother, but in that case, we were the two women. It's just you and I in this world. And because I am a single mother and I'm not looked at favorably in our society, if you fail in anything you do, everyone is going to look at me. And I'm not trying to put pressure on you, but I'm telling you that our success, there's no separation of the success. Your success is mine. And I'm going to back you through till the end. 
and that's what she did so wow. in conversation in prayer in just telling me go for go for anything you want to do everything you want to do you can do it that was my mother that is still my mom I, we, we speak every day she's hilarious she's brilliant she's funny she um she's stubborn you know doesn't always listen to what i have to say um or doesn't take on everything i say but listens to everything i have to say and and we argue and we have our good moments but she has been such um a strength um and a pusher of my vision and i i mean having a mother who said to me that if i have to sell my house for you to get an education i will do that you know you it's just a level of selflessness that I hadn't seen anywhere else that I saw in her. And so we have that beautiful relationship. And I've tried to do the same with my daughters. It's quite different because I have a husband that is very involved in their lives. And so what I have with my daughters is the kind of relationship where I try to make them my best friends. But at the same time, I try to put them right. I try to help them to tell the right path, whatever that is, because we're all learning in this journey and sometimes yeah. they 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 teach me as well because there's so many things i mean we're, we're two different generations so there are things that they say to me and i'm like wow that's interesting and so we also have that beautiful relationship there as well and when we're together my mom my daughters and myself is so interesting to see when we talk and 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 try to come together on different ideas it's so interesting to see all of us you know there's a thread that runs through and i think it's just that determination and love and kindness for each other and to succeed and make the best out of the female, you know, diaries that, 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 that they are. So it, it's, a, it's a really wonderful relationship. And your mother was the first female professor of taxation in Nigeria. Um, yes, she says, she yeah. says it's Africa, but then she says it's Africa, but nobody believes that. So say it's Nigeria. And I'm like, okay. It's <laughs> <laughs> Um, I love I love hearing that so much. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks. And then, um, you know, I, I started my last two questions by asking you about your mother because you begin the book with your gratitude toward her. And I, I love reading acknowledgments um, because I, I love seeing who influenced and moved people. And your first gratitude and your acknowledgement is to God um, for, as you say, for every breath, for every word, for this gracious gift and for the ones to come. Um, thank you for that and, and for the humility of that and the, the deep devotion of that. Um, I wonder if you might speak for a moment about what you see as the connection between divinity, faith, and creativity. Wow, that is, I've never been asked that. That's just powerful. I, I think that I, I see that creation you know divinity creation is is so linked to creativity because you know i believe that the world came to be through a creation right it was somebody's idea god's idea and he created this amazing thing and and as an author myself i am putting myself you know in that position where i'm also creating my own world and so when i go to write I have to lean on what I call the master creator, right? And I say, look, you've done this before. Now I'm going to do my own thing now. I need your help, brother. Help me out here. And so that's the kind of relationship. It's, 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 and it's very intimate. And I love just sitting down and just feeling that I can hear what to work on next. And if I don't feel that, I don't know how to explain it. There's a kind of peace that I seek it within me. If I don't hear that peace, I could work. I could work. I could write 200,000 words. And that peace of mind or spirit or soul is missing in that work. I would not release that because I feel that I've just not connected. And I think that's what it is for me. I just feel that um, that, that relationship is so important for me to be able to tell stories because I look to God who created the world as it came to be through his words and his genius, genius ideas. And I'm like, well, I'll, I'll give it a try myself and see how it goes. So yeah, that's, I think that's it for me. So I have, every time I sit to write, I have a moment of just deep breaths, deep reflection, a prayer, and then I go. And I just trust that something great is gonna come out of it. And just as your characters and your creations surprise and delight you, I would imagine that God is 
<laughs> equally surprised and delighted by us and um, by by what we can make. And um, I really feel like this is a this is a deeply divine book, um, and, you. and that your your work is. I can feel that spirit in your work, and and I appreciate it so much. Um, I'm going to let you go back to Thank your you. wonderful, busy life and your writing and your beautiful daughters and your world and the worlds that you are going to create for, I was about to say for us, but don't do it for us. <laughs> <laughs> don't do it for us. Do it, do it for yourself. And then we'll, we'll end up being the beneficiaries of it. Cause that's, can that's I, can I just say that I, I think you're such a beautiful person in and out from the moment you reached out to me, I could feel the, the love, the beauty, the truth in you, in your soul, in your words. And I just, I just want to say thank you because you've made me feel so at ease. And so I feel like I've known you forever. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for, for giving me this platform and for giving me your time tonight. Thank the, you. The, it, truly, it was, it was the greatest thing I've gotten to do in a very, very long time. And um, I'm happy that you enjoyed it. You've brought such joy, grace, and transformation to so many people through this book. And I urge everybody to, to buy it and to read it. It is available in 16 <laughs> different countries now, so you don't have an excuse wherever you are in the world. You can read The Girl with the Louding Voice. Um, I loved it so much. I'll never, ever forget it. And I, and I cherish this opportunity to talk to you. So all Thank blessings you. to you, sweetheart. Thank Lots you. of love. Take care. Bye. Bye.